Hola pro guys familia, soy Rafa. We got another Wild Rift video for you today. This time we're tackling one of the most important aspects when it comes to solo queue and Wild Rift in general. And it's all about how to carry through laning phase. This video is great for everyone, even jungle mains like myself, because understanding how your teammates want to win the game influences your early game decision making as a jungler. Without further ado, let's jump right in. Remember gamers, the beginning of every game starts during the champion select phase, not necessarily when you load onto the Rift. Securing the best possible picks on every patch is one way of increasing your way of winning the game, especially for solo queue where you cannot depend on your teammates to always be on the same page. So it's important to have the best possible chances to win in regards to your own lane. As Wild Rift is a very fast paced game, it gets super snowbally whenever a lane gets the advantage over the opponent. It's very rare for a champion like Fiora to win a lane and then magically die 1v1, unless they just dive like a monkey. But obviously some champions are able to exert more pressure than others, but if you're familiar with all the rules and guidelines, you won't be caught off guard many times. Also, shout out to Riot because they gave us a new tool that allows us to swap the pick order in champion select and it's, it's amazing. Thank you, thank you so much. Being able to swap and secure powerful picks for others is so OP and should be done more often in solo queue. It's even more important for players that aren't playing the strongest blind pickable champions. For Baron lane, just imagine you don't have Fiora in your champ pool. But what do you do? Even though Fiora can be put into an annoying spot when facing a Garen, it's still not safe to say that Garen will be able to shut her down. Fiora is just one of those champions that really shines with player skill. If you're better than your enemy when playing Fiora, then you're gonna win the lane. There's no way around it. Nonetheless, blind picking other Baron laners such as Gragas or Renekton can result in very tough matchups that lower your carry potential. As a rule of thumb, you can view it like this. The harder the matchup for you, the harder the game is going to get as it unfolds. Now don't get me wrong, it's not about winning all lanes, but becoming very consistent in the way you approach the lane itself. Knowledge is key and constant growth complements improvement and this is where you get into play. Utilize your brain to come up with solutions to problems you haven't thought of. Also, be sure to check out our Discord in the description below. Regular giveaways, community events, and other community related activities are waiting for you there. Make sure to check us out. The first thing after selecting your champion is to adjust runes and summoner spells. Let's say you're playing into an assassin like Akali. Their goal is to burst you with their rotation and put your HP bar into lethal range. It's very common for assassins to lay towards a specific pattern. First, they're going to put your HP down to roughly 50%, then they'll kill you on their second rotation. And this is exactly where proper summoner spell choices and runes comes into play big time. Rather than defaulting to your barrier and bone plating, you should take a closer look at exhaust and adaptive care space. Whereas barrier can be used whenever you feel like it, exhaust on the other hand requires some knowledge about what's about to happen. You need to identify the enemy's most dangerous spells and exhaust them fast enough to reduce their combo's damage. In addition to that, most assassins put themselves at risk the moment they go in. It's either you or them, and usually they win due to the sheer power differential. However, it's a completely different story with exhaust. First, you lower their damage by a lot, and even better, you slow them afterwards, and thanks to the slow, you'll be either able to increase the distance between you and them, or you hunt them down with it. In the beginning, it will feel a bit weird to use, but for now, it's definitely an underrated summoner spell. Think of it as a offensive defensive spell. Also, adding adaptive care pace to the mix grants us a second layer of defense. Dropping below 50% HP gives us bonus resistances depending on what type of damage we've taken prior. And it's not just a minor buff, believe me, I've used it. Speaking of this new rune, it's time for our question of the day. How do you feel about the newly introduced runes in adaptive care pace and bone plating? Which do you favor and why? As per usual, let us know what you think in the comment section below. Next up on the list is something that is equally as underrated as changing up summoner spells and runes, the choice of your starter item. Not many champions are presented with a lot of diversity in terms of those and are kind of forced into a specific build path. However, there are also exceptions. Under some circumstances, you're not forced to start with an item that grants damage stats. For example, if you're playing Diana into Orianna or Corky, they're both infamous for their early game poke and tend to be very annoying in lane. A trick on how you can survive lane with ease is starting with a ruby crystal and run second wind into your runes. With that, you can out-sustain their early game laning phase with ease and you won't lose out on minions. Ideally, you want to think about what your opponent does best and think of a way of lowering that plant's potency. Sometimes you'll be able to find interesting loopholes in terms of items, runes, and summoner spells that you haven't considered before. One minor change to either of those three can have a large impact on your laning phase and therefore your game. Similar to that is the question of what completed item we're going to build first. If we want to win lane, we want to aim for an item that grants us the biggest power spike possible. Alternatively, if we're already in a position where we cannot win the lane anymore, we need to look for items that serve another purpose. With all that out of the way, let's talk about the lane itself. We're all familiar with the fact that minions run into our lane periodically and we're supposed to kill them in order to acquire extra gold. But what if I told you that minions can do so much more than offering up their last hit gold? Think about it. If you want to last hit creeps, 
then also your enemy wants to do so. Consequently, minions and their immediate surroundings become a point of interest. In Dragon Lane, it's your typical business. Support and ADC have the play in unison to pressure the enemy off CS. The real deal about it, though, is that every time someone commits an auto attack on a minion, they basically stun themselves for a brief duration. This self-enforced CC can be abused by the enemy in the form of poke damage. You hit a minion, they hit you. If you repeat that multiple times, you'll slowly be drained of your resources and cannot play in the lane anymore. That pretty much covers the very standard move, but there's more. Depending on what lane constellation you're playing into, the room for air either increases or decreases. To put this into perspective, walking into a Braum as an enchanter will most of the time lead to instantaneous death. Doing so on a champion like Leona, not so much. As a result, you're forced to follow specific guidelines as to what you're supposed and allowed to do. This portion of laning, however, is very much dependent on the enemy being aware of said guidelines. And you'd be surprised how many times they could have killed, but they didn't. Why, you might ask? They lack the critical information because most players base their play on experiences, and if they haven't experienced something similar before, they won't actively think about it. To put more emphasis on those guidelines, let's go with an actual example of a matchup. Let's say we got Braum Kaisa against Alistar Tristan. Alistar's only move is to go in and CC the enemy while soaking a lot of damage. This creates room for his ADC to play in as well as granting them plenty of options to deal huge amounts of damage. The only scary part about Alistar is his CC combo, and he only gains access to it on level 3. On level 2, he can briefly CC you with Headbutt Pulverize only. But what happens if Alistar faces a Braum? As Alistar, you can only go in if you are in a bit of a dire situation. Braum loves it when the enemy tries to engage on their team, as he is able to put up a shield that blocks all projectiles from a certain direction. The only thing Braum has to make sure of is that he isn't caught by the initial crowd control of Alistar. If he happens to be caught while standing on top of the ADC, it's going to be a very rough time. Therefore, Braum needs to position slightly away from their ADC. This way, he can use his second ability to quickly close the gap, then put up the unbreakable shield. Now, with the enemy ADC being unable to play, the Alistar can get beaten up, at least when he's not level 5 yet. Otherwise, you can just turn on the ADC and murder them without any problem. So, unless the Alistar lane is able to quickly kill the Braum, for whatever reason, they should never, ever engage on him. Because if they do, they'll lose. Taking all that into account, you should start to view matchups based on their relative champion strength. Think about what they can do rather than what you've experienced yet. Being aware of the power dynamic allows you to approach the wave in an entirely different manner. Previously, you poked the enemy if they walked up and punched them, but now it's about zoning them off experience and suffocating them from further gold. Facing a lane that is weak in the early game with a very potent lane such as Draven Janna or even Ash support opens up very interesting opportunities. You can block their entry to lane and deal significant amounts of damage to them before they can even reach the wave. Even delaying them by a few seconds can already make the world of a difference between losing the first melee minion or not. Losing it would result in a big experience disadvantage that can be abused soon after. To make the most out of your lane, you need to pay close attention to your experience level. The moment you spot that the next minion is going to get you level 2, start asserting dominance game and walk up aggressively. This level up itself will function as a heal and a damage buff at the same time as you'll be granted another ability to make use of. The next step after is to keep up the zoning until the next wave starts walking in. To avoid taking too much damage, you'll briefly take some distance from the wave and either walk back a bit or hide in a bush temporarily. Now all you have to do is push the wave as slow as possible into the enemy tower, ideally so you're able to crash it on wave number three, which is the first cannon wave, and this is also synonymous with League of Legends. This would allow your jungler, if you pass for you, to get Scuttle Crab for free. In the case of the enemy team contesting the crab, however, they'd be down in experience, late to the play, and would lose a huge amount of gold and experience to the tower. As a rule of thumb, you never want to give your enemy laner anything for free. So make sure you force them into a trade for everything they want to take. They want a minion? Too bad. You're going to have to lose HP on that as they just stunned themselves for that auto attack. He walks up when they're not allowed to. Nice. Gray screen. Become a demon in lane and show them what you're made of. All the presented concepts today are only meant for one purpose, getting as much gold as possible to win every single upcoming exchange. Winning lane grants you accelerated access to higher stats, which increase your strength and therefore the likelihood of getting objectives. There's a reason why most of my colleagues and I say while well, we're casting esports events that the enemy team is smacking the other team with thicker wallets. It just means that because they have more gold, they're able to buy more items and therefore have better stats whenever it comes to fights around objectives. And when it comes to objectives, 
objectives, dragons aren't the only objective that you have to fight over. You can force the enemy to come to you if you're splitting as a baron laner or a mid laner, or you can death ball and group up with the rest of your team if you're super strong as an AD carry and support. Just ping your team to start grouping around you, and you will be able to force a lot of fights in your favor as long as you have better stats than your opponents. Even if taking the objective means losing on a dragon in the process is the trade, that's a completely fine trade. Unless it's the Elder Dragon, then don't do that. that that's a different story. Like we said before, once you have your lead, either deathballing down a lane as a team or forcing the enemy to come to you via splitting is all dependent on what choice you end up making. But whatever choice you make, godlike laning will provide you with all you need to do what you want in the game. Woo! Ya terminamos, familia! That's gonna be it for today's video on how to win through laning. If you liked the video, make sure to like and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any future Wild Rift content here on Pro Guides. With that being said, stay safe, gamers, and have fun on the Rift as always. Adios! Thank you.